we have a small enough crowd here that at some point what I'll want to do is have everyone talk about what they're doing you know, after we've laid out some of what the Agora uh, chain is like and some of what we're doing, I want everyone to, to, to lay out what they're doing so that we can all think about the use cases that, that um, people, the, the user stories and the problems that people want to solve. But let's get started. I am Dean Tribble. I am CEO of Agora. And, um, and I guess I'll be your host today for our conversation. Um, and we've got several looks at the app, at the um, system. Here is our agenda. That did you change it to start at eleven? Yes. Okay. So so I will talk about Agora and the environment of smart contracts in JavaScript and some of the some of the some of the uh, elements of Agora. We will we have several people. There are several teams building on Agora that will be able to demo some of what they produce, which is pretty awesome. Really great stuff. And talk about the design of it and what it takes to build an Agora, some of the some of the support that the, the infrastructure brings, some of the components that they bring, and that sort of thing. And we'll introduce them as we go, but let them be fun. We'll have a coffee break, and then um, uh, for the JavaScript programmers in the room, Diego will our, is our director of uh, DevRails over there. He will dig into some specifics about the hard JavaScript or and other support that 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 the company brings to developers and the ecosystem brings to developers building on Agora. And then finally, we'll end up with uh, uh, talking about Jboard Academy and, and uh, um, facilities to be able to learn more about building on Agora and get additional support. So we'll, we'll see this agenda later, but these are some of the things that we have prepared to talk about. And at any point, Feel free to ask questions, and we can dig deeper into the things that are specifically interesting to you. You know, law in at least a little bit, or make sure that they get covered, and we have opportunity to talk about that. So, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your, your time here, and please just you know raise your hand or shout out if you have a question. And especially like this, if I need to repeat what I said a little bit slower, okay? Because I will speed up and swing. <laughs> okay. Um, so first, uh, you know, is everyone here? That, so who here has used a smart contract? Okay. So most people here have used a smart contract, or I would say the answer is probably going to be everybody. And it's important to lay shared groundwork for what is a smart contract. I worked so I worked on the first production of smart contract back in 1989 which is five years before Vitalik was born and quite a bit longer before there was blockchain. And so, oops, sorry, there we go. So a smart contract, when, when these ideas came up, when we were you know, deciding and debating this stuff with Nick Zappo, when we were building out in the early days of the internet, it, a, a, a smart contract is software that its execution enforces the terms of a, an arrangement between third parties, right? A contract-like arrangement between third parties. And so it doesn't have anything to do with blockchain. It has to do with software essentially enabling strangers to cooperate. So eBay has enabled millions of people to sell millions of goods to total strangers who then showed up at a strange location, picked this thing up, paid money, and went away with it. Or the, and the eBay software, the auction software, the delivery software, decided who won, charged their credit card, scheduled delivery, did all of these things to facilitate these strangers cooperating. So eBay, PayPal, Venmo, Uber, uh, Amazon, high frequency trading. These are all things where software enabled total strangers to achieve cooperation with people that they have never met, might not like, and might never see again. Right? And that's made for a more cooperative world. That's the vision that's been driving us forward over decades to enable this stuff. Okay, and so what blockchains bring is what, what the reason, the thing, the advantage that blockchains bring is it's, or, or is they have, blockchains provide software executing in multiple environments controlled by independent parties 
in multiple jurisdictions, so different governments, different regimes, take your pick, all coming to agreement about data and choices. Dean has $100 in his account. Dean bid in an auction. And now Dean takes back his bid at the same time that the auction closes. You want it to be the case that either Dean wins the auction and gets that NFT, or Dean gets his money back and someone else wins, not both. And that's easy to do when you're on a single machine. But when you've got 100 machines run by different people, coming to agreement about that is hard. And much of the advance in, in, in computers as a result of blockchain is around different fast ways of coming to consensus about, the, about those kinds of choices and order. Did Dean win the auction or did he get his money? And uh, that's important because that gives you a level of integrity of execution that now no one individual organization or regime can compromise the integrity of the execution of the software. And so now that smart contract business that is doing electricity sales and auction between you know, uh, uh, solar power plants and retail, right? For, as an example use case, now there's not someone in the middle that at the end of the day can slip in just a few more clever bids in order to take a little bit more money out of the system. Like Enron did several years ago where they were illegally engaging and manipulating the market. Right? You get the ability to have software businesses that launch that you can rely on them because there's not a human in the loop to, to over time gradually get persuaded to do things. Not necessarily right. There's a bunch of other advantages about being able to have software businesses deployed as smart contracts. But that's sort of the core of why blockchain brings value to smart contracts. Okay, the problem with existing platforms is it's not, it, it, you know, like Ethereum, especially, you know, Tezos, et cetera, is you need to learn a new programming language that usually is not a great programming language, but it's strange and sort of targeted specifically for some problem set. But it means you have to learn it. And in many cases, they have intrinsic safety hazards, right? Ethereum is what's called synchronously re-entering, right? A calls B, calls back into A before A has gotten to clean things up. And as a result, we have collectively lost 10 billion plus dollars, right? Ten, more than 10 billion dollars to losses that would not have happened if that system did not have these fundamental security hazards in their architecture, right? And so that's not a great thing. You'd like to use other architectures that avoid these, these security hazards. Also, because they're new environments, because they're new languages, because they weren't thought out with respect to good software engineering sometimes, you've got, fair, relatively speaking, poor tooling. It's advanced greatly in the, in the last couple of years, but it is still not caught up with what mainstream tooling and what mainstream application development had in the early 90s, right? You know, the late 90s, right? You know, so, so we're still a long way to go for things like, like Solidity or Nicholson or you know, pick you some random other programming language before that move. And so as a result, again, of it being hard, of it being dangerous, and of it having poor tooling, is there's just a very small pool of developers. Now you think that means if I got into it, I could be one of those experts, but it means you don't have a lot of people to collaborate with. And it fundamentally means that a lot of opportunities to, to build things in a decentralized fashion never happen because an enterprise just can't find enough people to do it. So even if you're one of the experts, they can't find five others, so it's not worth starting the project. And so it would, it's a big advantage for all of us to have a deep developer pool of people we can work with and in, to enable lots and lots of projects. Okay, oops, that's a great idea. Yeah. So, our focus, you know, the, the hardest thing to scale is the number of developers. And so our focus is on enabling 
the world's developers to be able to build smart contracts. And that means meeting them where they're at. 14 million developers in the world build, build systems and applications every day that control trillions of dollars in JavaScript. Right? And so what if you could use that to build decentralized applications? That's what will enable you, to, you know, me, and a million other developers to be able to build this stuff. So our focus then is how do we grow the program rates? How do we make it programmable? It's about achieving the level of programmability such that you can use your existing skills. So we have we enable smart contracts. And we have a platform for writing smart contracts in JavaScript. Now, specifically, it's hard in JavaScript, which is the JavaScript you thought you were programming in, but you might feel like you might discover later when Diego talks about it that it's that, that, that you know. JavaScript per se is not quite what you thought it was, but hardened JavaScript is the language you need to program to. With a framework that is designed for smart contracts. The reason why JavaScript is the number one programming language on the planet is not because it's the most awesome programming language, but because it enables building frameworks where other people, other developers, can build components that you can reuse. Right, that I can take from the library of a million components on NPM and pick and choose the ones I want to incorporate, and I can use them easily and plug them together. And when you take something like React, React.js for doing user interfaces, now those components are visual components, and the framework provides rules for plugging them together safely, such that this component that's supposed to have a little display here, I can use it here. I can have a big screen version. I can have it over here, and these two are related. You get the ability to plug and play all these components that third parties built and produce new components for other people to reuse. And that ability to do components literally gives you exponential growth in the power of individual developers because every component you build raises the level that everyone else is building. And so that's the core of the, the, the usability, the programmability uh, 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 promise of building in JavaScript is that there can be this library and growing set of components to be able to build from. And then finally, it interoperates, it, it's got you know, intrinsic built-in uh, ability to connect asynchronously with other chains in the, in the Cosmos ecosystem, which has hundreds of chains now that are connected with what's called IPC. I'll talk about that in a minute. And over other bridges and, and, and connectivity things to Ethereum, Aave, Filecoin, Solana, all the, all the various other ecosystems out there we really choose. Okay. And I realize I'm taking longer because I'm talking slowly, so I hope this will be Okay, what's our test? I'll go a little bit faster for some of these, right? We have Cosmos underneath. That is the best in class proof of stake infrastructure used in, in, in billions of dollars worth of chains over the last four years. Above that, we add our JavaScript VM. Our, our, so that is not just JavaScript, but it's hardened JavaScript, deterministic execution. So the same computation produces the same result on hundreds of machines every time. Um, and checkpoint restart. So instead of having a transactional world of read some data, do a little bit of computation, and write back, which is how you have to program your the blockchain. Instead, you have long-lived JavaScript processes just like you would expect to have in a Node.js or, or something like that. We have this framework that I talked about, the Zoe framework, that provides the rules and structures and primitives to be able to rapidly put together applications. And you'll hear a lot about that from, from our, uh, the our application teams here. It'll happen again. <laughs> um, we have contracts that we built using the same framework and components and generated use, reusable components for you to start from. Um, and we could go into detail on that, but, but th those exist for you to, to be able to leverage. And then finally, there are the applications, the contracts and dApps that you and others build on the platform. Okay. So I mentioned the best, you know, so, so because it's JavaScript, and you know, people ask, one investor a long time ago asked, so what are you going to do about your development environment? To which the answer was, well, you know, Microsoft spent $120 million building a pretty good one. We'll use the best one on the planet. How's that? Um, 
And so it's not just that you're able to use VS Code or WebStorm, right? But but you get the the uh, oh I don't have it here. You get to use Aave for for running tests or Jest for running automated CI and 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 unit tests. And you get to use you know pop up IntelliSense with the type information and the help and command completion and all the things that modern developers expect in an environment. You know I can stop in a breakpoint and put it and step through the execution of a smart contract transaction even if it spans multiple blocks in the same in the same blockchain. You know it's sort of what mainstream developers expect and it's awesome and you don't get it anywhere else, right? You know, the ability to leverage your skills and existing tools. Now. So that's sort of the tooling thing. Here, I, you know, the particular type is this is a mint, right? And this is saying mint to ping. That's actually generating, in this particular case, an NFT or a set of NFTs. <coughs> uh, a set of NFTs um, using that API, where it says create a new payment containing a newly minted amount. Okay. So there's this thing of an, an amount. I'm going to dive into some of the concepts that we have uh, that, that, that we'll, you'll, you'll hear about in the various applications. So an amount describes how much of something, right? The brand is what the something is. So an amount would be, you know, 50 IST, you know, three, you know, um, uh, so, so, or, or you know, three atom or something like that. It's not that you have, you don't want to have in real financial applications, you don't want raw numbers running around. You want to know what it's a number of. You don't want to add atoms and ETH. You want to add atoms to atoms in order to have more atoms, but have it be an error if you try to add atoms to ETH. But for us, this abstraction works for fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, or semi-fungible tokens. Any of those, the same class, the same amount, right? If I have an amount of, of NFTs, that's just, it's this one, this one, and this one. It's a set of NFTs. You can have a bag if it's a semi-fungible token. So there's 500 magic set, magic swords and, and 20 magic axes because, of course, those are very you know, precious. The, the same. Okay. Um, uh, so, so those are sort of core abstractions that show up in JavaScript, right? And then these are used to make the computation and putting together this framework easy, where a purse is you know is a is a container of a particular brand of assets. I have a purse contain, that contains the, the atoms that I own. I, have a, I might have a second purse that has other atoms that I owe someone else, or a purse containing my NFTs issued by a particular artist. A payment is something I withdraw from a purse in order to, in order to send to you. And again, it's just a JavaScript object, and it might contain you know, uh, 20 atoms, or it might contain three NFTs. And I can send those to you, and I can write contracts that are generic across payments that will escrow a payment. And it doesn't care, again, whether it's semi-fungible, fungible, or have you. And then to create all of these, we have mints. So when you say, hey, I, I'm an issuer, I want to make a new kind of asset, give me a mint and a purse and a payment for all of these. The mint is how you mint, you create new elements of that, of that asset type, of that brand. And so it will, a mint will produce a payment, you can then deposit into the appropriate purse. And then finally, there is, a, there is an object which is the issuer, that is the thing that validates, oh yes, this is a payment of the correct type, you can go ahead and claim it, such that if someone handed you a payment that they say is the NFT you wanted, you can go to the issuer of that NFT that you held, because that's, you know, you wanted a bad kid, they're handing you a payment that they claim is a bad kid, and you go to the issuer and say, is this one of yours? Did you actually issue this? And the result of that is that you get unique access. You get exclusive access to that payment, uh, to the asset that the payment contains. You get exclusive asset, exclusive access to the bad kid, or exclusive access to the three atoms that will be used to pay for. And so these together are what we call a kit, you know, for a new asset type. If I'm an NFT issuer, an, an NFT issuer, I generate a kit and then I use that to mint NFTs. My customers use it to verify that they got an authentic one and they have purses and payments flying around as they're buying and trading my NFT. And that, you know, users do that in JavaScript computations all the time. It's a couple of lines of JavaScript. Okay, now those are the foundational 
reusable components, that, that low-level you know, money or, or, or what have you. On top of which, lots of people have built, and these are not all built by Agora, um, higher level applications, services in decentralized finance, uh, components for doing NFTs, right? The NFT character builder, you hear about, hear about from Praia, NFT Marketplace, a reusable NFT drop uh, application. So if you wanted to do an NFT drop, you just instantiate it or mutate it yourself. You know, all these different components that are reusable for building up. Okay, now let me just, so that's, so any questions about the idea of components, right? Some of these are going to be contracts, some of these will be just software that you load in and use for your Apple. Oh, then I will jump to the next thing. I'm probably way over time, but there you go. Um, so, if you, so how many people here have, have actually used crypto, send money to other people in crypto, right? Use smart contracts. Okay, so most people. The basic user interaction in most of crypto is indeed what I refer to as send money to a random number and hope something good happens, right? What's the problem in this in this user sorry this user interaction, right? It's not that the value of ETH is you know down at three hundred dollars or whatever it was when I first created this slide. Um, don't be weird. Um, it's that I'm sending money to my good friend zero zero x five five two I mean, Dan Finley is the creator of MetaMask. He actually sends this because he may have an issue. May have an issue for years. And then the same thing in applications, right? In Cosmos, you know, you end up sending money to my good friend Cosmos One, G H K M, whatever, who's sucking your jaw, I don't know who that is. Right? And neither do you, right? And neither does anybody else, because it's just a random number. Instead, businesses in the real world have quid pro quo. I don't randomly send you money, I make an offer. I will give you this money if you give me that asset. Right? I will give you um, 30 IST. If you give me that character, you know, it might be your character, right? So let's give an example. And I use the, a simple example with bad kids because this was created before pre -alpers. That's really um, So if I were to auction off bad kid 37, um, I'm a seller. That's a digital good. I make an offer to the sales contract that says, I will give you this bad kid if you give me at least $600. And that's the seller's offer. That is an offer that goes to, to, to the auction. And then the client wants to bid, they make an offer saying, I will give you no more than $700, it's just the $700, as long as you give me at least the bad kid 37. And if you give me another bad kid, that's fine too. Or if you give me some change, that's great. But, but at most 700 for this bad kid. Okay. Um, and then the, 700, the bad kid and the 700, when they made the offer, the give, as it's called, goes into escrow. So it's not that it's actually handed to the contract, which is one of the fundamental architectural problems in most of these crypto systems, where they hand the asset to the contract, where if it rug pulls, has a bug, crashes, whatever, you lose, right? No, no, it goes into escrow in the framework, protected by the framework, and then the contract is notified that, hey, this offer is, exists, do you want to do something? So the contract executes, where we said, when I get a bid, here's the JavaScript function to execute. So it's just a JavaScript hook, just like in RAM, right? And it, it executes knowing that there is a software. And the, the main thing the contract can do is any determination, any code at once, incorporating JavaScript libraries, et cetera. But finally it says, okay, there's the winner, there's the seller. I'm gonna reallocate, so I take the, 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 the bad kid from here and give it to the winner. I take 650 ISD from there and give it to the seller. That satisfies their constraints, right? That means that the seller got at least 600 because he got 650, and the buyer got at least bad to 37, and he got some change back too. So they're both happy with that. That satisfies their constraints. If it did not satisfy their constraints, the reallocate would fail. It would fail because the system enforced it, not because the code did the right thing. Okay? And so that reallocate must satisfy the offer constraints, and it must also satisfy the currency as conservative. So you can't give 650 to that guy and 650 to that guy because there's only 700 play with, right? And then Zoe, the, the, the underlying framework, provides the framework for the, the payouts. And so what happens there, you know, the winnings and the refunds. And so that means Zoe automatically handles 
all the losers, they just automatically get their money back. The contract code doesn't have to do anything. They're just done. Okay. And that is the bad kid at 3700, which is the thing we were selling. He thinks it's great. So what does that ensure, right? Fundamentally, to the clients, it ensures that they get what they want or they get their money back. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. It's, you know, if, the, if the contract crashes, they get their money back. If the contract rug pulls, they get their money back. If it upgrades in a bad way, they get their money back, right? Um, and, if it, and it might still be a bad auctioneer, right? The auctioneer might still sell it to the second highest bidder for more than they, than, 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 than they should have to pay for, or less than they should have had to pay for. But as long as it's more than the seller was willing to take it for, you know, it satisfied the seller's offering. So offer safety, as we call this, doesn't cover all pieces, but like type safety, it addresses 80% of the problems, right? It addresses the vast number of cases where a contract rug pulls or, or crashes. Or, okay. And so the contracts, it really reduces your stress in some sense. You know, the, the first off, offer, you know, we're in an asynchronous world with assets coming from all sorts of chains, but once the offer makes it into the contract, the contract only hears about it after all the assets have been gathered and put into escrow. And so they're guaranteed to be, a, and, and, and they, they're verified by the issuer of the appropriate currencies that it's a legitimate NFT or it's an actual payment in, in the IST that you're expected to be paid in. And then finally, they will be delivered upon completion. And so that means that the contract, even though it's living in a very asynchronous world with asynchronous access to multiple chains, the contract sees the world in this simple, you know, I'm not deterministic, at, you know, atomic access to these arbitrary ones. Okay. So I'll go past that. I mean, it's, that was just JavaScript code that does what I described. It's pretty standard stuff. Okay. So any questions about offers? The reason I bring that up is because several of the applications really thought about how do we protect the clients so that even if there's a bug in the code, they're going to get what they want or they get their money back and, and you know, and we make sure that the contracts work correctly. Okay. Um, let's see. So, uh, and I probably only got, I probably only got a few more slides here. So, we'll, we'll just get, okay. So, I talked about being in the Cosmos ecosystem. Some of you here are in the Cosmos ecosystem, but not everyone. Cosmos uh, provided a framework for building blockchain. So, so we leveraged the SDK underneath to use that best in class proof of stake infrastructure. Um, so it is an ecosystem of chains built on that that all connect using what's called uh, uh, IBC, Proof Blockchain Communication Protocol, um, where that lets them share assets, move assets across, do various things. So you end up with this network, and that shows you the a set of some of the connected chains, the world has grown since this picture, of all these independent sovereign chains all communicating over secure programs. And that's native to us. In fact, we helped design IBC, we helped roll it out, we helped inspire it in the first place, where IBC, Interblockchain Communication Protocol, think of it is as like TCP for the internet, right? There's all sorts of fancy, crazy stuff to implement TCP, but for most of us developers, make a connection over there, send a JSON blob, thank you. Right, you know, give me an answer, all done. And so the magic of um, how, what does it take to have a secure connection is all handled by the underlying infrastructure. Well, IBC does the same thing, but between blockchains. And then, so we have the, the transport layer, or the, the, the tau layer that does the transport and authentication and ordering and recovery and security and all of that using best practices developed by lots of chains um, for very high security between multiple chains. And then we have application-specific protocols. The two noteworthy ones that I'll mention here are transfer, which allows me to take a digital asset on one chain, you know, atoms from the hub, you know, Osmo from the Osmosis chain, and take it across the network and drop it on the Agora chain so it's available and can be escrowed by uh, um, Agora for, for use by Agora smart contracts. And then the other is what's called interchain accounts, um, where you know I as a user can go up to the to to you know one of these chains, you know Terra or Osmosis or whatever, and make a trade, and I have an account and a position. What interchain accounts do is they they allow a smart contract on another chain. Most importantly, of course, Agora. They allow a smart contract on another chain. Um, uh, too many better ones. Uh, 
to act as a user. So they are creating a user account. So anything that can be invoked by a user on Osmosis or on a Kosh or on the Hub or what you know on whatever it is that it addresses can now be made available to a JavaScript smart contract. And that means that, um, as as uh, uh, Calypso will talk about later, that means you can have a portfolio manager written in written in JavaScript to be able to manipulate positions and act as the user on all these other things. Okay. So we have all these things. Um, uh, I, I occasionally get to, 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 I almost never have you in the audience, Joe, when I talk about the, the developer journey. Um, you know, we have a bounty program. We have various programs for developers to grow. And so Joe had a background in Node.js. Um, he picked up a bounty, which maybe you can tell more about this. Um, he, you know, on Agoric, succeeded it, knocked it out of the park to do this asynchronous access over other chains inside of, inside of JavaScript. He went on to be the lead developer on the Cosmos snap that, that for MetaMask that enables MetaMask to be able to do signing and transactions on, on Cosmos and on, and on work. And then finally, he's launching an application that he'll talk about later with his, uh, with his cohort um, uh, uh, called Calypso. And I will leave it at that. Um, and um, oh, look, you're, you're, you're next. You know, just in order to be. So, um, so I will introduce. Uh, yeah, I will introduce Joe Schnetzler or John um, to come up here, whichever he wants to to to, uh, to, uh, to talk about this. Actually, before you stumble down, so thank you for your attention. Um, was I slow enough to understand? <laughs> yes, so, uh, so thank you all, and uh, uh, and now we'll have. Uh, uh, Joe and John from Calypso come up and tell you about that application. Yes, you can stand up and scratch all the windows. Where is this? Would you like one? Yeah, I'm going to go here. Okay, sure. There is a map. There's a map. You can write your map. And I don't know if you can my volume. You can hear me just fine. I haven't seen all these demos, so you know I may be one of the people asking questions too, but feel free to. to, to yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, awesome. Very, very awesome. Great for working. Uh, thanks everybody for having me here. Um, so imagine you could build an app in blockchain and you wanted to target Ethereum users, but you didn't know how to build the split. You had no idea, no desire to <laughs> sit down and work as much. I spent all the hours doing that out. What do you just build with JavaScript? Well, Calypso is an example of building regardless of the location and targeting the desired audience. So Calypso is an interchange rating terminal, and it allows us to really target and sell, allow people to buy, trade, really stake, help, beer, do anything in crypto regardless of it's, it's original destination. So, Calypso is a product made by Liz Mystic Labs. That's me, John, you're on the right, and Joseph, Joseph Schnetzler, the guy that Dean was just talking a lot of great things about. Um, standing right there, too, right as well. And Calypso is one of our flagship products because we know it's something that is going to really change the way people interact with crypto today. So, what is Calypso? Calypso is essentially a platform enabling data driven trades with ease and self custody. And the reason I say data driven is we're able to aggregate as much data as we can from different sources, but that doesn't really utilize the Agora stack. What, use, what utilizes the Agora stack here is the ease part, which is the one click transactions, where we're actually able to complete a transaction that, say, for example, you only own the theory and you wanted to go stake osmosis. Well, we can actually, in the background, Automate the entire process where we will take the theory, swap to osmosis, and stake that osmosis for you. And that's what we like to call our one click transaction workflow. We also aggregate DEXs and aggregate aggregators and aggregate routers. And this allows us to, being a JavaScript Accord native app, still target the theory native users, like what I was saying before. So having that scalability is actually key to building a successful app in. Crypto and not just crypto, in 
the startup industry in general because once we start building apps that focus on users instead of just developers, we can start to expand to larger audiences. So what I'm about to show you is a quick product demo of Calypso. It goes through pretty the, the front end where you can see the aggregated news feeds and different uh, ways to view your assets and trading. Um, this is just dummy data, so but don't prove this product pricing. Um, you can tell how simple it is to go and trade and just you select your assets when you want a simple traditional swap view or actually a more advanced trade view where you can build out your indicators and actually track your pricing more effectively. Um, and what we're about to show you is a demo of the one click cross chain transactions. So after you're viewing your address and making sure that you can see everything you're doing here um, and the whole news feed process. Um, event, we're going to go to the staking tab where it shows you uh, dummy data of actually staking optimism, but you only own osmosis in this scenario. So it's swapping from osmosis to optimism, and it's taking that optimism token that's on optimism and staking it for you through these different steps. Normally, you're having to sign a first transaction, that completes another window pops up, sign another transaction, boom, another window pops up, sign another transaction. It's a terrible user experience, and it's just something that we're not doing today outside of crypto. This is answering those questions for really building out a better user experience for real users that are, we want to bring in towards this industry. And once we start building more products that are catered towards a better user experience, we're going to find large user adoption. So our real edge is the one quick cross-chain transactions that I was mentioning, as well as the aggregation of DEXs, routers, and aggregators, as I mentioned before, as that allows us to really have infinite scalability. Right now, we're, we support Cosmos chains, we support Ethereum chains, and we actually support Bitcoin and Solana. And we're able to support all of those due to the different DEXs that we aggregate, and even aggregators that we aggregate that have support for those. Why build out a DEX that you're limited in what you can develop when you can build an aggregation engine that you can just take the best of what's already out there? Similar to how a Gorge JavaScript uses VM, VS Code, or uh, managed the JavaScript. And then aggregation of data, so like I was saying before, we can just aggregate data from already successful news feeds like CoinMarketCap and different places that are already creating valuable data to use in your trades. So, how did Calypso start? Joe over here was building out a bounty um, on a board. He's working on a bounty for interchain accounts. And we were also working on Deep Fund Finance at the time, another thing that people that Misty Labs works on. And we realized how hard it is to manage ICA accounts on chain to chain. So we decided to build an authentication met method around ICA that would make it less complex for really managing accounts on different chains. And that's the inception of Calypso. After the completion of the ICA bounty, we were like, we have something great here. Let's make a, a full-fledged product out of it. And the four components we ended up using that are, of course, the hardened JavaScript. Here's a nice little chart of how hardened JavaScript works here. You can go more into that later. Um, as well as the smart contracts in the uh, work blockchain, uh, ICA contracts that are living on different chains we communicate with, act smart contracts on the board, packet forward middle, packet forward middleware on the board, and Pegasus, which is just the name for privacy transfer contracts. So pretty much the different ways to transact between multiple chains in Cosmos and Ethereum. So what is ICA on the board? It's a way to control accounts living on different chains. So we're gonna help you say there's a user, enabling a user to live on another chain. I like to describe it as you have your own personal assistant living on the other chain. You're like, hey, go make that trade for me, please. <laughs> and then they go do it for you. And that's essentially how ICA works. But on building on a board, it allows you to actually take that less time and actually just buy JavaScript developers, the most common development language in the world. You can find as many people as you need to scale effectively to build out a better product. So you no longer have to find crypto native developers. You can find ones that they, maybe they have a financial background and they are they're really experienced in building financial products. These are the people that you want to have building your apps. So more potential use cases for ICA are maybe an EVM protocol. Maybe you wanted to build a product that you only want to target EVM users, but like I said before, you don't know Solidity, you don't know how to build an EVM product, but you want to target these same users. Build it on a board, and now with interchain accounts, that the interchain accounts are on a board, you 
can actually control those accounts on Ethereum and use your product in Ethereum just like you would normally. Or a limited order product on Cosmosis. So it's even easier to use in Cosmos Chain than Cosmos Chain. But say, for example, you want to build a limited order product protocol, and you don't know for us to Cosmos because you know they do enable a lot of uh, functionality, but it's once again fun down their hurdles you have to learn. Build out your protocol in JavaScript on a fork and using interchain accounts control those accounts on Osmosis data. And the only difference is the actual contract that you built would live on a Gorg instead of Osmosis. So if you want to learn more about Calypso, you can head on over to getcalypso.xyz. There's a nice little waitlist we have going on there, and it's growing by the day. And if you share, you move your spot up on the waitlist. It's awesome. And then uh, follow us on Twitter slash X, whatever you call it, at Calypso Dash. Um, we also, as a quick uh, note, Missing Labs has also built the Cosmos extension for MetaMask using the Gore's part in JavaScript as well. And this is using SAS SDK on JavaScript. And it, it enables users to transact in the Cosmos using their existing MetaMask wallet, um, seed phrase, and private key. And you can go find that at metamask.missinglabs.xyz. Thank you.
really isn't actually even on the developer side, although it does help them extensively. It's really on the user side um, by enabling different users to actually not need to know what their assets are, what they're doing with those assets. They can just say, I have this token, I want to do this action, go and make it happen.
push this trick before it has a place to throw the application we put together, which is death. Now, with death, we are exploring what NFTs can do, and we're doing this in collaboration with an artist named Manuel. I'll have some links as well to his art. Um, but we wanted to explore the idea of dynamic NFTs. Now, um, as for this talk, here for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to start by just giving you some context of who we are, it's Cryo, and then what we built. So the dead application and the Sages universe, which is created by this artist. And then I'll go a bit, a bit into the motivations of why using a board, what's good about it, what we find exciting. And, uh, and lastly, we'll end with the demo and uh, we'll run it a bit with a NFT character um, yeah, for the event to, to showcase the tech. So who we are. Um, we work at a company called Cryo, and we are a blockchain lab. We've been building blockchain applications for about a little over six years now. And we've not only been building on a board, of course, uh, but uh, we've explored a lot of other different protocols. We do some EVM stuff, uh, we've done some zero knowledge stuff. Um, so we kind of like we got exposed to a lot of the different uh, solutions that are out there for building applications and creating apps. So um, I won't spend too much time on this because I really want to get into the application itself and also how our board uh, relates to it. Um, so yeah, let's uh, just get straight into what Dead is. So Dead is a character builder that builds on a board and it showcases the Sages universe uh, using dynamic NFTs. Now this probably doesn't tell you a whole lot, so you probably have a lot of questions about what are, what are these uh, Sages universe and what are dynamic NFTs. So I'm going to briefly go through it and then um, a lot of the things I will explain uh, throughout the demo as well because then it will be more clear. So say this universe is this dystopian, um, dystopian future story that this artist has been working on. He used two art codes to go to his Instagram and see um, a bit of the art that he's put out. Um, but essentially he's creating this whole universe um, and then we uh, made, oh well, he's made um, the assets that will be the NFTs. This includes um, currently a supply of 1,000 character uh, NFTs, as well as over 500 items that can be equipped with. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. But let's just talk about dynamic NFTs uh, first. So, dynamic NFTs are basically a new way of proposing and trading digital assets. The idea here, to keep it simple, I'll just go into detail a bit more throughout the demo, um, but the idea is that you have a character NFT that can have item NFTs equipped to it. And it's built in such a way that when you, um, when you equip an item NFT onto the character, you're essentially sending that NFT to the contract, which allows us to then, if you were to transfer the character, all of the items that are equipped to it would be transferred as well automatically. We think this idea is really powerful and can open up a lot of use cases. Um, so yeah, can't wait to show you. Now, why would it work? This is where I want to spend a little bit of time. And again, I'm not going to go into detail on what ARGB is uh, or like the implementation details of it, but rather I want to tell you what we find exciting about it and as builders, why this is something that we find um, really good to build on. So, wait, yeah, let's just stay in this one for a bit. Um, so, here to be, it's a unique approach to digital assets. Now, when you're building an application um, on blockchain, normally there are only a few types of assets that you want to work with. They mean uh, mostly fungible assets and non fungible. Um, so, we find that the for example, the Ethereum approach and the classic approach that a lot of chains have involves shipping code that is, for me, a little bit too low level to feel comfortable about how like the implementation details. Like I just as a developer, someone building an application, I just want the behavior of an ERC20 token, for example, or or a, uh, a non-fungible token. But I don't want to necessarily be responsible for writing code that manages the account balances and all of this. And so this is where I think that Shekhoor is taking a bit of a unique approach where they've done the work on the code to make sure that these assets are just available to you as a builder 
to a simple API and then you get the expected results of the token that you're building without having to worry about the security that you would on a lot of the other systems. Um, this is also what allows them to implement offer safety because now they have these uh, combined set of assets that they're working with and that they're built into their SDK. Um, so we think that offer safety is also a really, really powerful concept because as a developer as well, we, um, you know, we, we write bugs sometimes. Um, and the, the thing with blockchain is that it promises to move a lot of value because inherently you can represent value in a digital way. Um, and that's where you want to start to be like really careful about your code and you wouldn't want to like, you know, put a bug in a contract that's going to move a lot of value because uh, we've seen throughout the years on the Ethereum ecosystem and others, uh, there's been plenty of hacks and these hacks have not been on the consensus layer, right? These have not been on the infrastructure side. It's just been code that people put out of contracts that ended up blocked with funds um, or making it so that people essentially lose their money. And with upper safety, by allowing users to express what they're wanting to get out of a transaction, um, you're essentially safeguarding bugs from um, having the negative effect that they would. And this is obviously really good from a user's perspective because they no longer have to trust that the code they're interacting with is completely safe. Which of course, um, some would argue that if something's open source, anybody can go and check the code to make sure that that's robust. But in reality, most people do not have the capabilities to really understand what the code is doing for the time of these uses. So we think this is a really um, clever solution to that problem. And uh, it just gives you security where it really matters. And then lastly, uh, using JavaScript the whole, uh, across the whole stack, I think it's just super nice. Um, and we're still a bit early in the, in the whole uh, core ecosystem, but I think the tooling for this is going to get really, really good and it's going to allow for some things that are just not possible when you have different languages going on. So, yeah, that's a bit of uh, why, why we picked the board. And now I'll just go straight to them. So what we see here is the basically now my colleague Lisa is already logged in to the Kepler wallet over there, and he's already minted his character. He's actually made it pretty high level, 647. I think that's actually the currently highest level on the platform. Is that right? I think so. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. And he didn't even cheat that. He just did something. <laughs> I paid for this. He paid for this. <laughs> now. What we see here, so in the center we have the character, and currently you can see that the items that you see on the side are all showing on the on the main asset there as the quit. Um, if you were to click on any of the categories that are by the side, you would be able to see um, the item that you currently have equipped. And if you were to have other items in his wallet, they would show up down here. At which point you could play around with it, see how the, the character would look. If the, Different item, uh, we can perhaps show you that. Yeah, here. So, yeah, if you place here, you can see that that would change there. But of course, um, you know, you still make transactions when you equip and unequip. So, you wouldn't want to like have to make a transaction just to see how it looks. That's why we implemented this viewer before we, we actually uh, made the transaction. Um, but yeah, perhaps we can showcase that if he now presses equip. A transaction is going to pop up, and here's where that offer safety comes into play. So um, it's really nice that um, Kepler now has support for this as well, because now you can see here the, the gifts and the ones that the um, that the user is uh, basically signing. So it's very pretty clear. You know, the user should be able to see what they're getting into, what they're going to get back, and what they're willing to give. Should that be allowed? Um, so yeah. Um, what's going to happen in the background here is basically oh, we have this one bug in the front end where it's doing a double transaction. That's why I think he closed up the second one. But uh, yeah, now we gotta be. Gotta be now you know it's a real demo. So if you were to accept that second transaction, that would fail because you actually only need one. 
But in any case, that's just the front-end uh, issue there. So now, um, as you can see, the items have been flipped. So now this one has now come to our wallet. The other one has been sent to contract and it goes in here. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about the decomposability and basically making the character your own. Um, if you go back to the main view and now click on the information, there are also some metadata attached to the character itself. As you can see, this is a bounty hunter from the Wildlands. Uh, and this is our, our old pieces of the story that's behind uh, the project. And we'll be releasing more and more things about the project, um, which will also gamify a bit of like what you can do with each item. Perhaps you need a special mask to access this part of the story, uh, and these kind of mechanics. Same for the, the levels. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities and a lot of places we can take it from here. We're currently working with the artist um, to shape that and to determine when to release it. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of uh, previews for you uh, just yet. But I do encourage everybody to go and check out the app um, and play with it. Get yourself a character if you want. Um, you can actually showcase them if you want. Um, so yeah, you can see these already have a bunch. But, um, Places the name here. Uh, this would be a bit unique. Sorry. Yeah. So the name does need to be unique. We this is intentional uh, because the name will be included in the asset itself. Um, there is a file ISD uh, input fee that's going to get you a random character as well as three random items. So basically, you don't know what character you're going to get until you go through each transaction. So what's happening now in the background is basically the character has been minted and three different items are also randomly picked and being minted and it goes onto the inventory. Um, the items also have a rarity level. So by default, you will always get two common items and then one that will be rare or higher. If he gets lucky, uh, he might get a legendary, we'll see. So it's now being confirmed. So if we click there, we'll see. We seem to have gotten a scavenger. Go to it. Let's see. All right. Okay, so no magic, magic, it's, it's okay. Maybe not the best one, but it's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, th this is a bit of how the, the, the application works. Uh, like I said, please go play with it. If you have any feedback, please come to us. If you want to know more about it, if you want to know, more about why we can ignore it, perhaps we can talk. Um, so yeah, with that being said, any questions? This is live is on Linux, by the way. If you go to create the app, you can make your own character. You do need some uh, fast provisions like the ISD. You also need an Agoric Smart Wallet, which is basically an on-chain account that manages your funds, your invitations, and kind of gives your entry points into the Agora network. Uh, but yeah, go ahead, go to create the app, and play around okay, with yeah, yeah. it. One more thing, one more thing, we forgot to show the marketplace. So obviously, you can make the character, but this will not be complete without a marketplace. So, um, you know, you get three items by default, but there's a bunch more items that we basically just put onto, uh, onto the market here. So you can go and customize it, you know, maybe you want a particular item from here or from there, you can find it here. And not only that, but any item that is owned, including characters as well, um, you can put up for sale uh, for whatever price you choose. So that's a bit of a free money. So these are all um, characters that, uh, that have been um, put up for sale by people, including Tina <laughs> herself. So. <laughs> and by the way- I do not put that up for sale. This is so much trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that is it now. Uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, I think in some ways I love what this character looks like based on where he is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this is all there to you. Let's see. Uh, okay, so it looks like there's no more uh, legendary. There's still some legendary boxes. Legendary means there are fewer of them. That's correct. And are you actually are you using the semi fungible like this port or are you yes. there are no, no, there, there's a semi fungible. So uh, I don't know if you didn't touch on that too no. much yet. Uh, so semi fungible that, that's actually kind of funny because it ties back to the how how we actually got introduced to uh, 
about to report. Um, they, they threw a hackathon back in the day in which we participated and we came up with this uh, this concept, this, this, this use case that sort of required, uh, it was like NFTs, but we wanted a supply of a given NFT, which, you know, you may, you may argue like, okay, then how is that an NFT, you know, is there multiple of them? But uh, there are some use cases where that's actually kind of, kind of useful. I think uh, as Google said, like a ticket system, like if you, if you were selling tickets um, as NFTs and for, for a concert, for example, there may be a, a front row uh, ticket where any of the seats in the front row are valued the same. Uh, they're not the, the same as like the back row ticket. And for that, you have to a bunch of those. Um, but anyways, uh, from, from there, um, they decided to actually go ahead and implement that, uh, that into the network platform. So that's really nice to see. Um, and, and yeah, so in, in this case, as you can see, there are multiple, for example, if you arm of four masks. Um, now, these are actually contain the exact same metadata, um, but they there there are multiple of them, and that that's actually really interesting to play around with. Like front end wise, um, at some point we were we were developing this, and we're like, okay, but like, what if what if two people have this same one, and we're we're gonna make the call to the, to the we're gonna form the author, and like, how can we be sure that we're picking the one that the user has and not the one that's in the store? And it's like, wait, it doesn't actually matter. Like it, it just works. So that's that's really nice, and that's maybe one of the things I, I also want to leave with is like I before it is implemented some really interesting and novel ways to sort of deal with digital assets that, in my opinion, are sort of like they, they provoke ideas. So there's there's a lot of ideas out there, possibilities that I think you should all you know learn about it or get it, get into building. But uh, yeah, I think there's a lot to be done. And so, you know, the aluminum was fungible, the plastic was fungible, but they weren't fungible with each other, so you end up with this world of semi-fungible goods. And, you know, quickly that pattern showed up in voting or uh, uh, things that represent uh, staking, where one token staked on validator X is the same as another token staked on validator X for, for a rewards point of view, but something staked on validator Y is different. And so they would have, they would all be issued by the same service, but you have a subset of ones that are fungible with each other. And that turns out to be a pattern that shows up in economics all the time. The, those original assets I mentioned, you know, the purse, mint, etc., those are what are called the electronic rights transfer protocol that he mentioned, PRPP. And much of the architecture of the framework is about being able to make new kinds of property rights or new kinds of transitions in property rights. And so semi-fungible tokens just a new kind of property right. And, and, and so it's easy to extend that with property rights that are appropriate to, to, to the application that you create. I know that um, uh, someone was talking about you know, new kinds of ways you handle loans and, 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 and bonds, and that's, that would be a new kind of property right you can add, and it just plays well with escrow and with, with everything else. The other thing I wanted to add is, so these guys, he said this is live, Cry is the first Third-party application launched on Agoric. It launched earlier this week um, on, on Monday, and it's up and running and working. So thank you very much. <laughs> the other thing on Agoric is the stable token infrastructure that we built as part. Those are the system contracts, and that IST they're referring to is the stable token written with the same components, the same architecture, you know, as a application, a third-party application, or a second-party application. On the Agoric chain, it's something that everyone else can use. We're just getting all the way through through a real interesting, novel uh, third party application. It's really exciting. So, thank you guys. Thank you all for coming back here. Um, we can now uh, hear from our third application that uh, is in the in the uh, development, implementation, testnet kind of phase, heading out towards mainnet. Um, 
uh, right, Alex from uh, Bitefish talking about a travel. Hello everyone. Um, so um, we are uh, Bitefish. The house originally from Portugal, but now we are more than a few of you more English. Most common, thanks. Um, so uh, six years old, 45 centimeters strong, and uh, was attracted to all um, discovery and worry from one and a half years ago. But I'm also focused on the EDM, just a little bit of uh, art, and it was this nice experience for us. And uh, it's actually uh, our weapon of choice for the first. Uh, and uh, that is uh, travel. And uh, travel is a uh, short term short term of course for NFTs is uh, really important. Um, and uh, how many of you actually use or plan to use NFTs for the community or something that has actual benefit? Uh, and uh, can somebody like uh, speak up what's the utility and uh, what was your experience so far? Okay. I think it's for events, right? Yeah, for real. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Access to clubs, special like um, groups, commercial clubs. Uh -huh. Okay, good. All right, then uh, probably uh, you should be already familiar with the problem that uh, uh, even if NFT has utility, it usually also has like a low market utility. <coughs> so, uh, you know, you just want utility to have a limited option. And it sounds like Okay, -ish with the web three terms, but then if you think about it, and uh, if every time you would like to rent an apartment, you basically you would have to buy the apartment and then sell it back on the open market after uh, after your location, that would be uh, not something you want to do. And um, on the other hand, uh, when you own this NFT or something, you don't always use it to sell it, and therefore uh, you actually benefit uh, from uh, some additional revenue stream uh, by renting it out to the people who are. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the, the product uh, that we are building, uh, it's actually a, uh, like an easy, safe, and, uh, and, and fast solution to create a revenue stream for the NFT uh, owners in the Airbnb type experience, uh, and uh, for the uh, users of the own product to uh, get the utility without the uh, launch. So uh, how it works is that all the service will build and, uh, and uh, rent on seven so I imagine you are uh, playing a uh, web three game also on the weekdays, but not on the weekends, and you go and set the calendar that okay, this app will be available every Sunday and the next Sunday for the, for this price for for the December uh, conditions, etc. And uh, you don't have to do anything outside the rest to be taking care of the protocol. Um, and then uh, uh, currently the NFT is rented against the collateral mined by the owner. Collateral could be any any token you you can choose uh, could be stable, could be uh, volatile, it could also be another NFT if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and uh, uh, once the, the transactions are done, the, the ownership uh, of the NFT on the question is to uh, uh, One of the um, case studies would be uh, uh, education courses. So in this case, we have Alex and Helen. Alex was the NFT to access the online courses. And decides to make some cash, and Kevin uh, just like has some time to 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 finish wash. Yeah. Then speak up. Then. Speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, is good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as the outcome, uh, Kevin got access to the knowledge without committing to the uh, to to uh, all to all the entity for a while, and uh, Alice and uh, the rent. Uh, rent of all the assets he owns, and the platform is received a fee of the transaction. Uh, uh, the platform itself is uh, under uh, governance, so that means that whoever wants to be part of the traveling share, they, they can just by owning uh, part of the product itself. 
Um, now to the multi uh, utility cases, uh, uh, we expect that gaming and playable characters is going to be like the majority, at least in the foreseeable future. Uh, but uh, not only. I mean, there's going to also be like this style of the on merge from uh, uh, from brands uh, uh, that could be eventing as as uh, already pointed out here in the audience. Uh, there could be everything between vendors uh, uh, from uh, brands to advertising space, uh, etc. Uh, gated communities increasing. Any seat token gate that would be like your way to move in, a, uh, in the airport as well. Uh, uh, but uh, actually, whatever you, you can think of can be turned or represented as an NFT, even like the land ownership in the real world can and should also be rentable. And that's what uh, uh, the of the um, We are right now over here, so we launched the uh, the something called as version of the of the uh, in, in Cosmos a few years ago. Um, the next frontier for us is to go uh, and support assets outside of uh, Android. So the first is going to be uh, Cosmos is actually uh, as yes, uh, going to walk us through the uh, interchain accounts, uh, and then uh, later on this year, in the next year, we're going to push to uh, even embrace chains as well. Uh, and uh, focus on collateral free rentals. This is when you can transfer just the utility function, but not the, the option itself. Uh, even though this sounds cool, but you, uh, uh, you, uh, you have to understand that it's not only uh, for the price of the entities that people can afford. Most of the time, it's not about it. It's mostly about uh, not having to deal. With the with the ownership, as I said. Uh, okay, and now uh, to the uh, to the interactive demo. demo, demo. Uh, so this app is available at the travel.app um, uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, Josh, I'll show you. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, you, you can you can actually the wallet. No, it's not uh, so it's still there. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, uh, uh, here we have like a simple uh, browse navigation, and uh, you see we have two collections currently uh, uh, listed for rentals. That's uh, governance and. Uh, uh, for it to come in the collaboration exchange board. Uh, and uh, let's uh, see if we can uh, run some more developers. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, this is what you have to specify. Uh, for, for how long are you going, going to run this one? Uh, duration is based in. Uh, what's going to be the collateral? In, in this case, it's uh, going to be uh, ISD. And what's going to be the rental fee per day? Uh, uh, I don't think I have IST on my account here, so could you please run something that is with travel ST or something? So next one here, and let's go for the end. So this is something I have uh, uh, on board at the moment, and uh, after the, the time's up, it will return to uh, the owner. And uh, I also see my own here. Yeah, I own this travel, and I also can put it on rent. Let's, let's uh, see if I can rent uh, yours. Yeah, so don't mind the, the UX. That's not the point at uh, this stage of uh, But what you, you choose is that uh, you choose the collection. Uh, yep. Then we want this to be 
uh, rent a pet box just for a fixed price, or do you want to, to have another option like uh, to describe? So, like at least this amount of uh, uh, as a uh, remuneration, uh, and uh, then uh, what kind of what do you want to have? Uh, as I said, this could be any category supported from this moment, um, and uh, the rent and the duration in uh, days, minutes, or And then if you list uh, uh, as uh, yeah, the Can you, uh, if we if we can you expand it on the list and the uh, company together? Or uh, just the the other version, mm -hmm. that's the version we put yeah, on yeah. the What did you set up there? So it basically says that uh, the, 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 uh, the the description of the asset being uh, uh being for rentals and then uh, offer arguments uh what's the brand, what's the value. Grace period, one strike impression. Uh, basically, everything you, you just saw on the on the form. Uh, also, uh, so this is the transaction being signed. This, this offer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's keep the room. And uh, now uh, this particular travel is also available for everybody else on the website. Uh, to uh, so yeah, this is where we are now. Oh, of course, uh, the biggest uh, challenge uh, at this stage is the inventory. Uh, as I said, we are native on a grid only, and that's probably just a house <laughs> and three guys over there. So, <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, like this month, we will uh, include some of the Cosmos uh, Cosmos uh, FTP. Um, don't want to disclose it, it's going to be, yeah, but it's uh, going to be uh, IC integration and the uh, ICS on the cloud integration, and then uh, later uh, back to, uh, to Ethereum. And, uh, uh, just as uh, you guys said uh, before, and it's quite pretty before, it, uh, the reason we, we chose for it in the first place is because um, it's much easier to, to build, and then uh, uh, it doesn't matter which language uh, or which platform you use. If, if your product is not implemented in all the crypto, uh, you can build an algorithm, uh, you can do a whole new benefits of tooling and, uh, and talent available on the market uh, and uh, um, support from the community and, uh, and, and the company itself. Uh, and then just make sure that the assets uh, we're going to use as part of the application are somehow available through either the Cosmos uh, SDK features or uh, the ICA integration solutions. Uh, that would be it for now. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, is there any way to have like, some sort of like, like a home or something? Actually, it's subled. So, for example, like I run them to Dean, and then Dean can sell it to someone else. Is there something? Or can we yeah, of course. You, you have two options for the duration of rental. So, you, you there's no there's no limit. You can do everything you can uh, okay. as a, as if you are the owner, which you are. Okay. Cool. 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 What triggers the? How is it you trigger the? Uh, Collateral being collected, so they don't return the money. And how do they return the money? They grace period. They grace period. They expire. The rental will be liquidated immediately. And the owner of the utility will have access to the market to show their collection. So it will be very collaborative. They can be confident before the rental is liquidated. And um, the borrower will be liquidated. And is that triggered by on chain timers? Or that's one of the things you don't get on other platforms, generally, on chain timers. Yeah, uh, also, maybe we can add to that. Like, the on chain timer itself is like working on like uh, seconds that is actually possible. It has no unit time and no block based timers and everything. So, basically, you can just convert the timer timestamps you get from on chain. You just can't use them on real life, like in the real way. So, actually, that's the feature we actually rely on the most, one of the features that, which is built into the algorithm. Okay. 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 All right. Any more questions? All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much.
So, um, thank you, Crowell, and I'm really looking forward to having this. And it was sort of astonishing to me and delightful to me that we had a, we had a lot of our example contracts are DeFi. Right? We've got example contracts for covered calls and call spreads and and and, and things like that and auctions and so forth. We started doing just the NFT things because there's straightforward ability to mint NFTs, and then all, all these guys took up and run with it and ran with it and did all these, these very cool things. So it's really exciting to sort of see these a, a, these third party components that can get reused by, by other people. Um, so uh, now uh, Diego and Chris here. So Diego is our director of this DevRels. Chris is is on DevRels as well, and and I like that we recognize him. Um, <laughs> someone else that they couldn't recognize him, right? Um, so so as you get into as you get into developing. There are, you know, they'll talk about the, the resources that are available to you and dive a little bit into that hard JavaScript that I had that I asked earlier. Um, and then we'll go into some of the other, the other things available. After it's all done, we can dive in for people who have laptops and want to get actually set up. So lightfully recognizable is the kind of thing that Like we have already seen today, Crabble, like Crea, uh, Calypso, 
And they, like, this is where we're going to focus a lot right now that is creating like, better documentation for followers and like a really good educational experience so you can feel that you're guided in like, what is it, like, what is the purpose. Uh, and the purpose, of course, is going to be filled. You know, we're, we're going to have like samples and workshops that we're going to be announcing in the next few months for you to kind of like start really creating, getting the code there. And finally, you know, the scale. And this is where you're going to have like your dApps that you can share with the rest of the community. So what we expect is that in a few months, some of you and other developers in other parts of the world are going to be here in front of you or online uh, sharing your own dApps just like uh, some of the examples that we have seen today. So that's kind of like pretty much where uh, developer relations is focused right now. And then I'm going to jump to uh, Chris, but really kind of like the important part of all these minutes that I've spent here is visible. It's just JavaScript. You know, go to our documentation, learn more about that, and just you're saying JavaScript. Well, thanks, Diego. I you know I, I love this. It's just JavaScript, right? Um, and I think we've kind of heard this theme from, from the presentations we've heard already. You know, one of the great things about using a Dork and writing in JavaScript compared to some of these other platforms is you spend a lot more time. Than you would on other platforms, really getting to focus on that business or application logic rather than worrying about a lot of that low level code. Um, so, you know, the quicker we can get you through that learning cycle and, and building great things, the better. Um, so, that's kind of why I, I fell in love with the work. But you know, what is hard in JavaScript? Why JavaScript? Well, um, you know, originally JavaScript was not intended to support multiple applications, potentially adversarial applications in, in one execution or runtime environment. Um, but it does have some interesting properties that lends itself well to potential use in web three. You know, we have this sandbox environment. You can't have a JavaScript program going around looking for pointers to you know, interesting or vulnerable things. Um, you know, we have this run and completion of that loop. So I, you know, if you ever work in that uh, threaded or, or shared memory concurrency model, you know what a nightmare dealing with that box can be. And uh, sometimes they come back and surprise you. Uh, when um, so, you know, it does offer some interesting properties, but at the end of the day, we're kind of using JavaScript in, in a way it was never really intended. Um, so, why harden JavaScript? Well, uh, you know, I'll pick on you a little bit because I, I think you said it best. You know, this is the JavaScript you thought you were getting at the beginning. Um, and I really like that because when we talk about that, that learning journey that you have to go on, hey, how easy is it to learn something if it's what you thought you were getting from the beginning? Right, um, you know that that learning curve is really just kind of sliding down the slippery slope. Um, and you know, if we look at what's really going on behind the scenes, we kind of have this paradigm that's been going on for decades now, where we're sending other people's programs or code to another environment to execute. So we see it at the start, you know, early on in the mainframe terminal days. Um, as we move into client-server solutions, that paradigm expands. And then when you think about the modern internet, that's Really, what we're doing. Um, you know, we're not really trading static content anymore. We're trading dynamic applications. And that's great. Right? It gives us a lot of interactivity, um, reduces a lot of expensive calls that we have to make round trip calls. Um, but it does introduce some risk. Right? Running somebody else's code, especially in this highly anonymized environment, uh, can be a little risky. And so you hear some people say, hey, maybe. Maybe that's something you shouldn't do. Well, what's the solution to this? It's what we call hard JavaScript. You know, JavaScript is this very valuable language. Um, where we're willing to give up some of that flexibility and malleability, um, you know, in exchange that for security, confidence that you can start to interact with a lot of these shared objects at their boundaries without having to really worry um, about things like you would in a non hard environment. And I love this analogy. I'd love to take credit for it. Uh, this comes from Chris Cowell, uh, one of our, our developers. But he spells his name the same way with a K, so uh, I might accidentally get it attributed to me. Um, but if you've ever read the Odyssey, right, Homer and his Odyssey, uh, there's this famous scene in the story where <clears throat> they're sailing their ship in the sirens, right? The sirens sing these songs, um, and they're irresistible. And these songs are so distracting uh, that they end up leading the sailors astray, and uh, their ships crash, and then they fall victim to the 
desire. Well, Odysseus is smart about this. He says, hey, I want to hear the side of the song, but I don't want to take that risk off of the consequences. So uh, he tells all the guys on his ship, hey, put cotton into your ears. You can't hear these songs. We're, we're going to go into where the sirens are. Time me to the mast. So all I can do is consume this information, but I don't have to worry about any of the risks that come along with it. Um, and that's really the, the paradigm that we're trying to introduce with Mark and John and Stretch. Yeah, how can you safely run, execute, share an environment with something that might be potentially dangerous, but not have to lose a lot of sleep over it? Um, so, yeah, you know, in the end, you can enjoy that music, right? You don't have to worry about drowning yourself and taking that part out of it. Um, you kind of get the best of both worlds. And again, because you're working, the language is very likely you already know. Components, tooling, you very likely you already know. You're focusing a lot more on building that application than you are worrying about this low level code. And I think we've seen that evidence by the great applications we've seen showing up here today. So, um, how can you learn more? I'm going to hand that over to Diego, and hopefully this is going to have you guys a little bit excited. If you want to get hands on it, so Diego. So we're looking at like where to go from here. Uh, pretty much stay up to date. So contact us, or Chris, or myself. You get our information right here. And of course, one of the important thing is in the documentation. That's where you're going to get not only the reference references. Uh, to build your own uh, gaps, but also for the additional material that it's going to need. And of course, the last thing uh, that I was going to mention is that the next people that are going to uh, take the stage here are the people from the Chamber Academy that have already probably run uh, a full bootcamp around the board and around the hardened JavaScript. So they really do know, and well, you haven't seen them here before, they really do know uh, what we are talking about when we're talking about that hardened JavaScript. So uh, it was a good way for the, for you to come and like, learn about them, about what they are doing, and uh, of course about the boring and hard JavaScript. So I think Alex, are you going to come back here? Or is it Neil? Okay, I'll do it. It's a meal. Hi guys. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's more important that they understand it than I do. I've signed for questions, right? Yeah. That's what I Anybody can actually who's taking the course 
can like do it. And then like this, this happens two times every by the way, and the person take also had one lecture today. Uh, but since we got all the lectures recorded on YouTube, uh, we think that uh, going over async with your own pace is like a better option like we can uh, like explore. But still, uh, we will, in all of the intakes, we will do these office hours, we will update the homework content, and we will just be there to actually like answer students' questions as we can. So like, uh, we're planning to do the second intake in October. So like it's uh, like this <laughs> we are in October, right? <laughs> so it's month. Uh, like this is this is going to be the second intake, as I said. And uh, the registrations for the registrations, please scan this QR uh, code. It will bring you to a website that we will have your information, and then uh, we will get on board. Uh, you will you will get board. We will, we will start having lecture. So this is the kind of curriculum that uh, we have prepared for the. Like first intake, uh, we like in the week one we go over hard in JavaScript. In week two, like we actually explore the uh, underlying APIs that enable us to build some robust uh, DeFi applications uh, such as YRTP and Zoe. And then we just go and like to the answer protocol, and we just uh, like talk about the. APIs and what, how can, uh, how can we build applications around the core economy of Agora. Uh, so, like everyone had their demos today. Like, I think I'm gonna have a demo lecture for you guys. <laughs> uh, so, well, we'll talk about ERTP basically uh, because I think it's sometimes it's easy to overlook ERTP, but uh, when you just uh, actually go over the API, you will be surprised how a simple, small set of code can actually be so powerful. And like, but in order to like understand the ERTP, which stands for, stands for Electronic Rights Transfer Protocol, uh, we need to understand first what is an electronic right. So uh, like, and in order to understand the electronic right, <laughs> We need to understand the uh, object capabilities and what they actually are. So uh, here, like this uh, diagram is called a Granovander diagram operator. Uh, I don't know if I'm like actually butchering the pronunciation. Sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but basically, uh, the, the Granovander, Mark Granovander, uh, is a social scientist who actually works on like social interactions between people. Uh, but when you're thinking about uh, that, we know that the uh, market no matter works on social interactions. And with blockchains, what we're trying to do is like uh, making the computation of information uh, is an economy itself. And then when you think about economy is itself and social science, it's also related to people. So. Uh, but when you like uh, actually uh, putting the points together, you are going to see that like whatever algorithm is executing is actually really related to these social human interactions. That's, that's kind of interesting. So basically, what you're going to see here is that Alice knows Carol. Right? Alice also knows Bob, but Bob doesn't know anything about Carol. Who Carol is, and he he cannot. Uh, she, he don't know where she is. He cannot go talk to her at all. So basically, they are not the truth. And here, uh, what Alex, uh, Alice is choosing to do is actually uh, introducing Carol and Bob over the thick arrow you see, like it type the uh, it tries to foo. Like then the foo knows Carol, foo goes to Bob. Alice chooses to give foo to Bob. This means that Bob is now introduced with Carol, okay? So this is like the normal life. Like, I don't know you, I don't know any of you, but if I wasn't like into Agoric, right? And like, uh, Alex, uh, Alex introduced me to Agoric, so that way I get to know all of you people. So this is like how it goes in the real life. And so uh, this is actually the what the weather diagram is all about. And, uh, 
when we think about object capabilities, what we say uh, object capability is like a secure design of like implementing software where like in the dominated structure to build OS or operating system software is like using access control lists, which is basically if you are an admin user, any application you should open has powers to execute like an admin. So like, and we just give the power to the applications depending on who is actually one executing. But uh, this is like uh, a security gap in there where the, as an admin, like you're a human and you don't know what that application is doing under the hood. And like, that's why it's still not a very good idea to actually give that third party application all the power in your machine and then you're going to trust it's going to do what it's going to do. So basically, uh, what Agoric VM is actually executing like, is a structure where you uh, only authorize uh, applications through the object references they have. Like, if my application is going to need some file or update some file on the local machine, that application doesn't need to actually go on to the network at all. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pass the right to write files in my host machine to the application and that's all, which that right is presented in digital environment as an object. So this is the way we actually pass capabilities between objects. So when you think about it, when we actually like try to pass uh, right, uh, can you scroll? Can you scroll? Yeah. Up, up. Are you sure? No. Yeah. You can just go to the granular diagram. You're still here. <laughs> like, yeah. Up, up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, when we think about like how to exercise those rights, like we represent them as objects. So when you think about it, yeah, this is the right to execute operations on my local file system and you don't need any data. So this is that object capability and we are thinking about it. So you can just go up and <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah, we just talked about uh, the transition between the rights in the real human world and the rights in an execution environment like a like computer. So, like there's a like uh, I was reading most of the papers that have written about this for the past twenty years about the interval, Mark Miller, and other Lisa, or the other people's like, and there's a huge community in there, and like uh, this definition. I think it's really like really good like what to understand what a right is. So rights help people coordinate plans and resolve conflicts over the use of resources. So like when you think about it, like uh, if you go to any economy class, one thing you are going to hear for sure is like economics is like there is an infinite needs of people but there is a finite uh, resource, right? there's a finite set of resources. So we need a way to actually share those rights between those indefinite set of needs. So that's why, uh, and we, we are actually like civilized people, we don't usually kill each other and like argue over stuff. So we need a set of rules and rights actually represent what those rules are. When we go back, Yes, what space? Rights partition the space of actions to avoid interference between separately formulated plans, thus enabling cooperative relationships despite mutual suspicion, which I don't trust the so software right on my machine, but I need it to do the thing that it, is, it says it's doing. So I don't trust it, but it needs to run. And competing goals. Okay. And when you think about how uh, we actually know the objects, they are actually like well, executing some stuff 
on computer. When you go into the electronic rights, broke objects, and that's another like good definition here. Like object references represent a right to perform a set of operations on a specific designated resource. So in this context, we can use electronic rights to address real world problems which are currently being resolved by the rights we know as normal, such as normal like contracts, law, courts, etc. So when think about it, when we actually execute some real life, uh, when we try to solve some real life problems over a uh, software product, what we do is that we use software objects to actually represent real world rights, and this will transform them into an electronic rights. So actually, we are just getting there on how to do the uh, like a new way of doing business. Okay. So uh, like we just said, but it's really easy to confuse an electronic right and era. Okay. So we said how objects are actually can turn into electronic rights. Now we need to work on how electronic rights can turn into e rights which is actually what ERTP is all about, okay? And ERTP is the actual API and protocol that enables how we can actually like enforce a set of electronic rights and then turn them into e rights which is uh, like guarantees some of the stuff you definitely need in order to do a business, right? So, uh, this is a blockchain and all of other products is like proposing a better way to do real world business, right? So we have been doing business so far, but now we have a better way. We have a more efficient way using a shared execution environment like a blockchain and giving the correct incentivization to all who actually participate in it. So as I said, let's imagine like the there were weather operator about Alice, Bob, and Carol, and they are actually objects living in an object environment. So what happens here is that Alice has the right to invoke some resources uh, from Carol. So like Carol is like I don't know. Uh, let's say it's the file operator reference. Like you can, Carol can write files to your machine, and then Alice knows Bob, so she can pass her right to invoke Carol's Bob. That's what I'm, I was saying. Uh, Alice now introducing Bob to Carol so that Bob can write some files to the computation, to, to the host machine. So Bob is another application that needs that reference to work. And Bob has no way of invoking Carol if Alice refuses to pass his right to him. That's important. So, and Carol has no authority to invoke. Carol doesn't know anything. So the type of right we are actually seeing here, like rights have types, okay? Rights have types. And the type of right we are inspecting above is like, it said shareable right. Like why shareable? Shareable, I mean, once Alice gives the uh, reference of channel to Bob, Alice still has those references. So this means that Alice and channel now share the reference. So it's a shared right. And also, that's exercisable, of course, channels writing something to the machine. And it's opaque, like, you don't know what the actual object is going to do unless you actually get it. So it's like opaque, it's closed. It's like a black box until you receive the right. And then it's specific, like, you can receive another object, but it's not going to write some files to your machine. So it's specific. You need channel specific but this is an electronic and e right has to be exclusive because uh, when you think about the rtp as money someone sent you uh, some amount of money and then you need to know that you are the only one can spend that amount you've been received 100 dollars by someone and then you learn that the person who sent you the dollars actually spent so it's not uh, good to be actually a right to be shared if it's going to be actually build a business or not. So we need to know that we are the only ones who actually preserving that right. So, uh, and the other thing is that SA So which means that we said objects are opaque, right? 
So you cannot know what's inside until you get it. But in order to do an efficient business, you need to know what you will be getting after your trade. So in here, there's a dilemma, right? If you want exclusivity, you cannot have a stability as it is. So the like, solution to that, trust the third party. <laughs> we are going to introduce a trusted third party, but that trusted third party is actually the RTP protocol itself. No institution, no anything, no nothing. That's the RTP API implementing exclusivity and by trusting the issuers who's issuing to that RTP asset, also you get the SAE So this is our journey from an object. No, this is our journey from humans talking to each other, socializing, actually an algorithm. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, we have Chainboard Academy, like uh, our lectures kind of like this, like going on like 10 weeks. And this was a part of lecture two, where we get more and more technical and fully. But this time, I think it's certain stuff that you will, you will need to understand the code very. So I spent some time to actually put this together and then like put it in the lecture. So they were very nice. Yeah, actually, um, back to the next lecture, yeah. what is the share with everyone else a learn how they did prerequisites. So do you need to uh, have the economics how they get to well actually I think something's also like uh like overlooked is that if you are going to working with like cryptocurrency or blockchain you need mm -hmm. some kind of economic mode but that's not the like uh prerequisite that block as a block. Like in order to understand the revolutions itself or the actual value of the solution that you will be getting, you need some kind of economic knowledge. But that's like a soft knowledge, like you don't need to just go to school. Work. And of course, you need, uh, like if you're coming from a web to a JavaScript background, you're welcome. Uh, that's you, you will be awarded much more easily. And but still, like if you are a much student going out of, out of fresh from college. And like you've been like taking courses and like implementing different projects or different software languages, but you don't know actually any of them that deep. So that's still a great point to start to actually learn this part in JavaScript instead of other types of JavaScript out there. Like you can do, I don't know, maybe, like you can just overwrite any like problem like drawing objects or or this so you can just. Uh, you don't use uh, objects to and other stuff, which I really told about the correct is what they actually are. And like a secure and actually efficient way to scale and learn your like projects and YouTube jobs. So yeah, I mean there's no there's not much of it uh, actually the prerequisites unless you want to learn. Like okay, if you want to learn all great, that's all. Thank you. out it's generally familiar patterns and it's just objects right in react you have things where a widget comes up it's handed to display to display it. it's part of the system it has no right to display anywhere else that's exactly the kind of pattern we're talking about where someone handed you the authority to display so that's what you can do and you can't do anything else that kind of confinement is pervasive in the architecture it's pervasive from top to bottom and it gives you sort of this multiple levels of, of, of confinement of, in, in, and safety in how these components are built and how they work with each other. Um, the, so, I'm, so I'm going to wrap up here and then we will go out to another round of food out there, you know, hang, hang out as long as you like. The, the vision behind Agora is, is a world where all the activities we have, whether it's not just ticketing, but then the, the parking and the events and the dinner reservations and the commemorative things and the and, and, and the, the the swag you get from the event and all those things are a rich economy of lots of independent businesses cooperating. We see that we see that in order to move the economy forward into decentralized applications, 
you need that same level of richness in your smart contract. So it's not that the world needs, as some people have said, you know, 10, 50, 100 smart contracts. You need, you need an AMM, you need a lending protocol, you need a few other things. It's like, no, no, we need all the ways we cooperate. We need all the everyday uses of software and all the everyday actions we take of, you know, ordering a package and having it be delivered that crosses 20 vendors with lots of different uh, financial and, and contract arrangements. We need all those things to be able to be decentralized so we can have more independent actors operating in higher integrity in a way that lets each of us have more control over what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's a lot of the vision behind Agora is enabling our entire world of software to become more reliable, more changeable, and more extensible so more people can cooperate. And, um, and so that's why you know, targeting getting out there to where millions of developers can build this stuff is such a critical thing for crypto and Web2 and, and, and Web3 and, and all the rest of the blockchain environment to get to. And so thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you for listening. We would love to get uh, feedback directed to Diego and Santi and Preston. Um, and anyone here that, 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 that has a red shirt except for John. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, you can yell John, that's great. Um, and you know, thank you so much for your time and for your attention. And I hope you got something valuable out of it. And we're happy to get feedback in any form you want to provide it. Um, and, and the shoot out there, and we'll be here to talk. So look forward to hearing your ideas and, and, and your, your thoughts. Thank you.